Um, I would like for everybody. Fifteen years ago, a friend of mine, Winston, lived in Philadelphia. And he sent some tapes to my friend Ned, who lived in Colorado at the time. Ned quickly had somebody make copies, and he sent them to me. I heard this guy speak, and it was like, oh, my gosh. And I was activities chair at the time, so we quickly organized an event like this, and then he spoke that night. Um, Don, we became friends with him, and then he has a Monday meeting at his house. 25, 30 people show up every Monday. Great meeting. And he said, you know, you guys drive into town. I'm going to meet you at a meeting uh, here on 22nd Street in downtown Louisville. So he's an attorney and everything. I'm thinking, oh, this is terrific. We're going to have some lawyers and doctors and people like that. He took us straight into the hood. I was like, oh, God, we're going to come out of here alive. And the thing about it is everybody knew him. Those were his people. That makes me love him that much more. You know, there were no doctors or lawyers in there. It was a great meeting. And we go up to his place often on Monday. If you're ever in Louisville, he has a meeting that's really great. And that's it. I love him. Let Help me welcome Don M. from Louisville. Thank you, Sandy Sue, and hi, everybody. My name's Don Major, and I'm an alcoholic. And uh, looks like about half of you all have probably heard about all me, you, uh, me today. You really need to, but uh, <laughs> at least you're captive for a little while. But I'm up here tonight not to talk about the steps in particular, but to uh, try to do something that I'm not by nature well-equipped to do and that is follow directions. Um, we're going to need some divine intervention over the next few minutes here. Maybe you guys more than I am going to need it. Um, and the first place we're going to need divine intervention is that something's going to have to get Don Major out of the way, and it's not going to be me. Uh, my sobriety date's April 9th of 1981. And I'm not a bit more capable of getting me out of the way tonight than I was in April of 1981. It truly has got to be divine intervention. Now, if you are newer and you are intellectually offended by some old fool up here talking about divine intervention, not only do I understand you in my old seat, uh, and I've got a suggestion for you. When I say divine intervention, just substitute the magic from the steps, and it'll get you to the same place and won't offend your sensitive intellect so terribly. But uh, <laughs> the other place where I can think of we're going to need that help is, is with the directions, and the directions are, are pretty simple, and that's to talk a little bit in general about what I was like and what happened and and what I'm like now. And with God's help, we're going to try to do that. Um, I grew up, as far as I ever did, uh, in, uh, on a tobacco farm in Trigg County, Kentucky, which is in southwestern Kentucky on the Tennessee line. And uh, up until I got sober, and I was 37 when I got sober, which is hard for me to believe I was ever 37 too, so I've got sympathy with you. Um, and up until that time, I had a really rivetingly interesting and romantic saga. It was way past the story about my early struggles and my subsequent rise to power. And, of course, it was all about how by my iron will and my sterling intellect, I had picked myself up by the bootstraps from the depths of poverty to those staggering heights I'd reached in life. Uh, and I believed that crap so sincerely that I was apt to have both of us crying before I finished telling it. 
And I don't think I was honestly and truly sober a week until I realized, man, what a load of baloney. We weren't even poor. Uh, we weren't anywhere close to poor. We were middle-class farming people that had everything we needed and most of the things that we wanted. And those staggering heights of mine turned out to be a whole lot more staggering than they were high. Uh, my alcoholism is a many splendored thing. It's got so many parts to it that I'll never discover them all. I stumble across a new part of my alcoholism every day or so still. And one thing it is is something that my high school English teacher would probably call a disease of superlatives. And what that means is that without divine intervention, I won't think in terms of things like good or bad. An ordinary will never cross my mind. I'll go directly to the extremes of everything, best, worst. Truth is, drunk and sober, I've been a whole lot more ordinary than my ego's ever been comfortable with. But uh, <clears throat> my capacity for self-delusion is astounding. And if I haven't done the work I need to do today to get my help, it's fully intact. If I've learned anything in a while around here sober, I've learned that I don't get much divine intervention on Saturday based on what I did on Friday. It's truly a one day at a time, at a time thing. <clears throat> and that, that self-delusion is just right there. But what was really going on that first 12 or 13 years of my life uh, wasn't any of that interesting romantic crap I thought was going on. Um, the book talks about selfishness and self-centeredness being the root of our troubles. And what this meant to me for a long, long time is that the first thing wrong with me is that I've got a disorder of my ego. I've had it all my life. And it's been right at the center of my life, my entire life, every day. And on account of that disorder of my ego, as far back as I can remember, I've been so obsessed with myself. I've been so obsessed with how I believe I stack up against other people. I've been so obsessed with how I feel that for decades I have boiled the bedrock of my alcoholism this is where it starts for me. I'm not peddling it to you. But where my alcoholism starts, I'm convinced, is in one sentence. And that is, without divine intervention, I will always wind up letting how I feel be the most important thing in the world. Now, without divine intervention, I can give some lip service to something being more important than how I feel. And I might be able to act for just a little while like something's more important. But if I haven't done the work I need to do today, when the chips get down, I'm going to go back to my default position and how I let how I feel be the most important thing in the world. And all that obsession with myself has always had the same result with me that I think it has to have with any human being. It's always created so much pain and, and so much emptiness and, and difference partners down inside me that I've never been able to stand the way I feel inside without either stuffing something in there and or just running as hard as I could. Uh, with that, without something stuck in there, I, I don't have any peers. I, I can't be on your level. I can be above you. I can be below you. And insanely, I can be both at the same time. You see, because I, I, my ego disorder makes me an egomaniac with an inferiority complex. And what I mean by that is I, I'm perfectly capable, without divine intervention, of feeling too good for something or somebody. And at the same instant, knowing I'm not nearly good enough for that same person and that same thing. All my life, I've known I could do anything. And at the same time, I've always known I couldn't really do anything. And that crap's been bouncing around between my ears for 74 years now. But, <clears throat> and I'll tell you that the 12 steps of AA that are the only program of recovery we've got, and you folks 
who are the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, or what has filled up that emptiness and done something about that pain and that apartness and that difference a day at a time for 37 years. But <clears throat> the mess I brought to my first drunk when I was 12 or 13 was a totally self-absorbed kid trying desperately to stay a half step ahead of a screaming fit, trying to keep all the balls juggled and the mirrors flashing and the bells working so that you couldn't see what I was and what I wasn't, and I wouldn't have to stop and look at it because I, I, I think a part of me uh, had a feeling that if I really had to stop and look at what I was and what I wasn't, it would be like the earth would just swallow me up through that emptiness in, in my own middle. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the mess I brought to it. And that first night I got drunk, I got in an awful lot of trouble, and I puked, and I blacked out, and I passed out, and I woke up the next morning, and I had a terrible hangover. And I swore all those Baptists around that farm were right, and that I would never, ever touch that stuff again. And I couldn't have been more sincere. And actually, it was fairly effective because it was nearly a week until I got drunk the second time. And I got drunk that second time, and that was nearly a miracle based on the way the next quarter of a century was going to go that I, w I made it nearly a week. And I got drunk that second time for just exactly the same reason I got drunk the other several thousand times. That first time... When I got enough of that booze in me for the very first time in my life, the magic had happened. Now, I did not know the magic had happened. I didn't wake up with that hangover and say, Hey, Mama, the magic happened last night. Uh, all I knew until I got sober 25 years later was that for a few minutes on my way to puking and so on, I had passed through a right pleasant neighborhood. But certainly the magic had happened because... For the first time, it made me feel good enough inside that I could stand the way I felt without either running or trying to stuff anything else in there. Now, for the next 25 years, I didn't know that there was anything other than the booze and in the latter years, the things like it that could do that trick for me. So the bottom line was really simple. Since the way I feel is the most important thing in the world, and I didn't know there was any other game in town to feel the way I needed to feel, it really didn't matter what it cost, and it didn't matter who it cost, because the way I feel is the most important thing. I don't want to give you a bunch of a drunkalogue uh, tonight, but uh, I will tell you enough that you know that I did not come in here because it gave me the hiccups. Um, from the uh, first time I got drunk until I got sober 25 years later, um, not only alcoholism, but in my case, uh, alcohol dominated everything in my life. Uh, I'm very confident that in that 25 years, I, if I went to bed, and there were nights when I, many, many nights when I didn't go to bed, when I passed out in some other situation or in the later years when I just tried to change the combination I was putting in my body and fly through the day. Uh, but uh, I, I was drunk sometime during the 24-hour period uh, at least 80% of the days uh, for that 25 years. Uh, I had no idea that I was drunk that often because the only definition or standard I ever had for whether I was drunk was whether I blacked out. If I remembered everything, that discussion was over. I was not drunk. Now that Kentucky uh, has got that blood alcohol limit down to 0.08, uh, I probably woke up drunk 80% of the mornings. So. Uh, school school was, was really easy for me. I was given a lot of gifts. I, I managed sometimes, I think, to turn them into curses, which I have a knack for doing with God's blessings. But, blessings. but uh, I had a lot of academic gifts, and uh, uh, despite the fact that I was often running on my drinking, uh, I managed, when I was 16 and a junior in high school, winding up my junior year, I was still holding on to uh, 
things like popularity and grades and, and that sort of thing. Um, but the bricks were falling all around me, and I knew they were. And, and by the way, it was a different world in the 1950s in, in Trigg County, Kentucky. A kid who drank the way I did and acted the way I did in today's world would find his little butt in an asylum before his 14th birthday. But in the 1950s in Trigg County, if you were cute enough and smart enough and had the right last name, you could practically get away with murder. And I, practi I practically did. But at 16, I knew it was time to get out of Dodge because I knew I was, uh, things were collapsing and I knew why. I knew it was my drinking. Zero, zero denial. I knew exactly what it was. And uh, so that was on one hand, and the egomania was assuring me that that tobacco patch couldn't hold something as hot as I was anyway. So I, I got on a Greyhound bus uh, in Hopkinsville, which was about 12 miles from the farm, and went 200 miles up to Louisville, the big, bigger city in Kentucky, the biggest city. And I kicked around for a couple of days and wound up on the doorstep of the University of Louisville. And they gave me a bunch of tests for two or three days and let me in as an early admission student with an academic scholarship. And my reaction to that was to stay so drunk the first semester that I lost all concept of day and night. It was just a matter of passing out and coming to. So I blew the scholarship. And then for seven and a half years, I worked full time, drank full time, went to school full time, and somehow got through undergraduate and law school. And I have no idea how that happened. When I look back on, on that whole eight years, I, I don't have a handful of really crisp, clear memories. It's just a swirling gray mass of alcoholic insanity. Spring of 1968, I graduated from law school and passed the bar a little later on that summer. And that spring, my, my daughter Dana, who was my only child for over 20 years, was born. I have a 29-year-old son now and three lovely stepdaughters by, by, by my sweet wife Sharon. But Dana was the only chick in the house for over 20 years. Uh, and she was born, and I started practicing law in downtown Louisville. And I practiced for about 10 years with a pretty good little bit of material success. Not nearly as much as I used to think I'd had. Uh, a peculiarity about staying sober a while is we, we get a better focus on the past. You know, folks tell you out here that you can't change the past. Don't believe that crap. We do it in here every day. Uh, and... Uh, uh, from the standpoint that I am now, 37 years sober, I was fairly su pretty successful materially. I've always been a criminal defense lawyer and always self-employed from the time I started practicing law, and I've always had a knack for getting involved in some cases that had some money and, and some publicity in them from time to time. And that's what I would stick in your face when you suggested that there was something wrong with somebody who lived the way I did. And it, I told you how crazy it was leading up to starting practicing law. Uh, it got worse. It got a lot worse. Uh, it got worse because I no longer had a boss looking over, my, looking over my shoulder. It got worse because I had some money to escalate things with. And mainly it just got worse because alcoholism progresses in everybody that's ever had it, whether you're drinking or not. That son of a gun just keeps doing push-ups and getting stronger and meaner and badder. Uh, and uh, during the latter years of that 10 years, I used a world of things other than booze, and I used a world of them. Uh, I'm not talking about casual use. I, I use a, a bunch of stuff, but as I mentioned this afternoon, don't get your singleness of purpose knickers all out of knot because... Uh, even though I used all those things and, and was addicted to a lot of those things, they were really all side shows to the booze. The, the booze was the big tent. February 10th of 1978, I had been practicing law for about 10 years. And I got full of scotch, cocaine, quaalude, speed, and vodka. And uh, I drove a Corvette off the Penny Rile Parkway down off the, in the southwestern end of Kentucky and you know, back on the Tennessee line at something over 120 miles an hour. Now, since the roads were icy, it was probably questionable judgment to be driving 120 plus. But uh, 
That wreck did an awful lot of bad things to my body. It crushed uh, both knees. I lost a good part of the main artery in one lower leg, and they had to do a bypass to take a vein out of the upper leg and graft it in to replace that artery, and it separated my pelvis and pulled my internal plumbing in two, so I didn't have a urinary function for over a year. I had what they call a suprapubic catheter that was simply a plastic tube with a flange on it that they bore a hole in your abdomen, pop that into your bladder to carry your urine out to a bag. Uh, they took me to Vanderbilt because I was closer to Nashville than I was to Louisville. Um, when they got me there, it was probably an hour and a half after the wreck, and I still had a blood alcohol of over 0 .40 in addition to all the other things I had in my system. I, they were, uh, I woke up either two or three times during the emergency surgery because they were terrified to give me enough to keep me under, afraid they would kill me. Um, the first year after that wreck, I was in hospitals for more than six months. I had a half dozen major surgeries. The doctors told me that I'd never walk again without at least a brace on one of my legs. They assured me that there was no way we would ever find a surgeon that would ever try to put my plumbing together so that I would ever have a urinary function again. <clears throat> By the grace of God, they were wrong, and it didn't have anything to do with me following directions. Um, it was truly the grace of God, of God that I had no uh, uh, no connection with at all, and as far as I knew in that in that period, um, I've been sober 37 years and haven't owned a brace for over 38. And uh, about a year after uh, the wreck, the head of urology at Duke University did put my plumbing back together and restored my urinary function. But I didn't know that was going to happen. My prognosis was never peeing again, never walking without at least one brace. Uh, they didn't know who I was at Vanderbilt and didn't treat me with nearly the appropriate deference. And uh, uh, I, it, when I'd been there a little over seven weeks, I got out of the operating room, the recovery room, and the ICU long enough to get myself moved against medical advice back to Louisville by ambulance. I, I wasn't stood up on an electric tilt table for the first time for two and a half months after that wreck. Uh, so I got myself moved back to Louisville, and uh, in some insane way, I, ways, I guess maybe they knew who I was, but it was a different world then, too, and uh, the months that I laid in the Louisville hospitals, I, I'm sure that there had to be some days that my friends missed, but I don't remember any of them, and the few surviving people that were involved don't either that basically every day my friends came in the hospital and brought me booze and more dope than the doctors were giving me. And I would lay in that hospital bed and say really intelligent things. I would say things like, you know, fellas, anybody can stop drinking when the going gets a little tough, but it takes a man to lay in there with it when the bills start coming in. And I'd tell them that just a man ought not be out there doing the crime if he's not prepared to do the time. And just because we'd hit a bump in the road, they weren't going to hear me, weren't going to hear me whining. Give me a drink and let's go on with it. Now, the reason I tell you that is that that is total insanity. And it's absolute powerlessness. And when you really think about it, it's letting how I feel in that instant and my need to change it be the most important thing in the world. Letting how I feel be more important than my child, more important than my profession, more important than whether I ever walked, more important than whether I ever peed, more important than whether I lived or died. The ultimate of self-centeredness, letting the way I feel be the most important thing in this universe. Um, <clears throat> I had a young lady with me when I had that wreck who was not my daughter's mother, uh, and at the time of the wreck, I was remarried to my daughter's mother. Uh, now, I, I'm going to make a, a, a sociological observation here. Uh, it's not in the big book, and it'll be the only one I make tonight, and please feel free to ignore it. But over the years, I've just watched and, and looked, and I've come to the conclusion that the fact that I was remarried to the same woman establishes my alcoholism without further authentication. 
I just don't believe a normie would do that. I, I think if they even considered jumping right back in a frying pan they just got out of, they'd tear the door off the asylum getting in to protect themselves, and we'd do it willy-nilly, drunk and sober. You know, old Joe and Sue are divorced, but they're dating. They'll probably get back together. And it works for us sometimes. It's not necessarily bad. It's just really different from ordinary people. End of sociological observation. But uh, and, and by the way, I've had to make a lot of amends because of that area of my life. I'm not proud of it. Uh, and I, I have to live some amends because of that. But I'm not going to fail to laugh at myself where I have been ridiculous. And obviously I got a brand new divorce right after the wreck. Now I wound up married to the young lady that was with me. She was hurt badly, but not nearly as badly as I. She had on a seat belt of all damn things. Uh, and uh, um, wound up married to her during that period. Um, about a year after that wreck, I made my first trip to the asylum. I hadn't gone dead broke right away because a little law firm of nine or ten lawyers had built up around this other guy and myself. So some money kept coming in for a while. And about a year after the wreck, I made my first trip to what I call the asylums. And I don't use the word asylum to be cutesy. The big, the big book uses it, and my mama used it. Uh, when I was a kid, people didn't have alcohol and substance abuse problems and go to treatment, uh, nor did they have emotional problems and go to the hospital. They went crazy and were put in asylums. And that's a whole lot more descriptive of what kept happening to me. And by the time I got to that first one, I still had the tube in my belly, my catheter bag, my crutches, my braces, and, and the phenomenon of craving that the, big, that the big book talks about in the doctor's opinion, the uh, addiction to ethyl alcohol, had progressed in me to the point where once I started drinking, I had physically lost the ability to stop. Most powerful, most painful thing I've ever dealt with. Drunk and sober, I've, I've had... Uh, Oh, 12 or 14 total major surgeries. None of them have even gotten in the ballpark of hurting me as much as each one of the last couple of hundred times I had come off ethyl alcohol. And by the time something did intervene and prize me loose from alcohol, it took three or four days for me to be physically able to do something like set up in a chair. Well, they got me through the three or four days, set me in the chair, and I know now somebody was reading the steps like we did here tonight, or how it works or whatever. But anyway, they got step three, all that mumbo-jumbo about turning my will in life over to some mythical god crap thing they were talking about. Of course, that insulted my intelligence, so I climbed up on my crutches and straightened up my catheter bag and said as loud as I could, do you mean to tell me there are people in this world who believe such crap? And I called somebody to come get me before those, poli uh, <clears throat> before those religious fanatics polluted my pristine intellect. Now that was sometime around the first year of, uh, <clears throat> first of the year of 1979. I got sober uh, about two and a half years later in April of 81. And I don't remember much that happened in that two and a half years. But some things that I do know happened are that I went back to asylums 17 more times. Uh, my new wife had to leave me on account of my insanity. And during that period, she was staying with some girlfriends and, and died in an accident. I last laid eyes on Dana, my only child, in January of 1980. And I didn't see or have any contact at all with her for over three years. Um, my law partners had to kick me out of the law firm that I'd founded because the social and legal pressure that my, my use of things other than alcohol was, was bringing on them. And I'm really grateful for that uh, because I proved that I wasn't going to make the decision that is bottom. And if you're new and you're struggling with hitting bottom, please don't wait for bottom to happen to you. I've seen hundreds of people die waiting for bottom to happen. I don't believe it happens. I believe it's a decision over which we have got a world of power. But I proved I wasn't going to make that decision. As long as I had a Timex watch, I certainly wasn't going to do it as long as I had a law firm. Right after the guys kicked me out of the law firm, the state of Kentucky jerked my law license. Uh, <coughs> by the time... 
the fall of 1980 rolled around, I hit asylum number 17, the next to last one, back in Nashville. Uh, they kept me there about 30 days. It's time to kick me out. No place to go, no way to get there. Uh, my roommate's family lived in Nashville. My asylum roommate uh, uh, did, or asylum roommate, and those sweet spiritual folks felt sorry for me and said, Don, why don't you come stay with us a few days and let's try to figure out what to do with you. And I went and lived with them a year. Uh, and the first six months I didn't stay straight, but it got better. And the shape I was in, I had to get better before I could grasp recovery or, or anything close to it. Uh, <clears throat> during that six months, I went to an awful lot of AA meetings, most of them at the 202 Club in Nashville. I got to where I could go two or three weeks without getting ripped sometimes, and that was a world record for me in or out of the asylum. I was a master at get, finding some way to get messed up in the asylum. And how I really know I got better is that in that entire six-month period, they only put me back in an asylum one time. At the rate I'd been going twice a year in the asylum looked like the picture of mental health. But late March of 81, I got on my most recent drunk, and it was another one of my pop-off vodka slash Listerine drunks. And I have honestly drunk a barrel of both those things. And this is not a joke. I have better memories of the Listerine than I do of that old hot pop-off. I can stand to smell Listerine today, but I can't stand to smell that old hot cheap vodka. But on this most recent drunk, I was drinking and taking everything I could get my hands on. Now, by the time April 8th rolled around, I'd been drunk 10 days or two weeks, and I was sitting on the edge of a bed in, in Nashville, and... Uh, a loving God that I had never asked for a thing that I did not believe was there, that I thought was a bunch of absolute hocus-pocus, uh, gave me that most beautiful gift I'll ever have. And I had no idea I had any gift. My mind didn't change about a thing. What that gift was, and it wasn't willingness, it wasn't a change of mind, it wasn't a change of attitude, it was simply that I started for the first time in my life to start following some directions about how to run my life, even though I didn't understand them, I didn't agree with them, I didn't think they would work, and I certainly did not want to do them. And folks, that's the only reason that I'm here with you all tonight instead of being in a pauper's grave up somewhere around Nashville for the last 37 years plus. And as I said, I didn't know I had any, anything was different. I still had the same uh, insane mixture of, uh, of, of unbridled ego and pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. Uh, one minute this program wouldn't work for me because I was so brilliant and special and complex, and the next minute it wouldn't work for me because I was so bad, and then I'd never been able to be responsible about anything. And you all didn't know how bad I'd been. If I were to try to get sober, it wouldn't do any good. It'd just be to be blown in two by a sawed-off shotgun or spend the rest of my life in the penitentiary. Back and forth. Won't work because I'm so great. Won't work because I'm so terrible. My alcoholism is the perfect sociopath. It doesn't have but one reason for existing, and that's to try to get itself the next drink. And it will tell me anything on the face of this earth to get it. It has no regard whatsoever for something that will kill you, me, both of us. It'll just, it'll throw totally inconsistent lies, well, inconsistent with one another, up against the wall, one after the other. It doesn't care, hoping some of it will stick. And problem is, part of my alcoholism, one, of, one part of that mental, uh, that, that many splendored thing is a disorder of my perception. So I'm subject to believe one of those lies. But uh, at any rate, um, I didn't know anything was different at all. And three or four days after that drunk, I stumbled back to the door of the 202 Club when I was able to stumble. Uh, and I did not think they would let me in, and in today's world, I would not be let in because I had passed out in their AA meetings there and had to be bodily carried out. 
they had caught me in their men's room with illegal outside issues. Uh, and they had warned the people they sponsored to stay away from me, that I was a loser and I was going to die. About two months before I got sober, a great big old boy by the name of Joe Wall. Joe was about 6'5". He's been dead 10, 12 years. And uh, Joe walked up to me there in 202, and he said, Don, I'm beginning to think that you really are too intelligent for this program. And I thought he was giving me a compliment. My knee-jerk reaction was, well, thank God they finally figured out who they're dealing with here. But Joe went on and he said, and you know, that's a real shame because we have never had anybody too dumb for the steel and we bury you buttholes all the time. And that felt like an icy hand closing over something inside me, and I thank my loving God that that icy hand has never completely let go. I thank God for that icy hand to remind me of that very thing, that this deal is not about intellect, it's not about education, it's not about learning, it's not about marriage, it's not about age, it's not about, not about beauty, it's not about gender, it's not about race, this deal of recovery is about grace, about grace and my willingness to follow directions coming like a little child and admitting that I can't, do, I can't handle or, get, or deal with any of this. But what I can do is listen to that spark of the divine inside and try my best to take just one little stitch at a time and leave that pattern up to my loving God. But at any rate, I certainly didn't know any of that when I went back to 202, but they did let me in. Uh, I remember exactly who was said, what was said and who said it. Uh, they said, come on in, Don. You are keeping us sober. And I said, will you all tell me one more time what I need to do if I want to live? And they said, oh, yeah, sure. Don't drink. Don't take. Don't go to meetings. By the grace of God, the first 60 days, I went to over 150 meetings. Had no idea why I was doing that. It seemed like the silliest damn thing I could imagine. Uh, I, I don't think I went to a single one of those meetings because I wanted to. Uh, and it was still so clear to me that you all were religious fanatics. And, and my brain was assuring me that what we needed to do was get our head out of the sand, get our butt back to Louisville, get some money, get a law license back, a big car, a good-looking woman, be somebody, for God's sake. But I'd been given that beautiful gift that I didn't know I had of being able to turn around to my brain and say, yeah, no, I know, I, that's right. But you and I have nearly killed one another. And even though these stupid meetings can't possibly work in our special and complex situation, we just don't have anything left to do. So I'm just going to go to them. And by the grace of God, I had the same thing backwards about that, that without divine intervention, I have had backwards and continue to have backwards every single day of my life. I make it all about what I think, feel, and believe. I make that the center of absolute everything. You see, I thought in order for AA to work first, I had to believe it would work. And then I thought it had to feel like it was working while it was working. And I think I also thought I needed to be able to see the causal relationship of A causing B in order for it to work. It turned out that none of those things had anything on earth to do with it. All I needed to do was get my raggedy butt to meeting after meeting and let my old sick brain and soul get dragged in there kicking and screaming behind the raggedy butt. And then they told me if I wanted to live, I was going to have to read the big book. Uh, and I said, I've read it a few times. And they said, we know. Uh, you've been quoting it to us while you've been dying. They said, if you want to live, you, you, you better understand first that this big book is not a philosophy book. There's nothing in there you can learn or master that's going to in any way keep you sober for a heartbeat. So what this book really is, is a simple instruction manual for your actions. They said, Don, don't believe this crap about recovery being a learning process. Said, you've got to learn about that much. And said, in your case, you have had enough information about recovery for the last two years 
to stay sober a day at a time the rest of your life without learning one single new piece of information. It's not what you know and don't know that's killing you, dumbass. It's what you are doing and not doing. And they said, if you want to live, you better open that book up and try to act like you've never laid eyes on it before and come to it like a little child and start at the front cover reading only the black part, not memorizing, arguing with, or distinguishing anything, not looking for anything it said to learn, looking for what it says do. And then if you want to live, lay the book aside and take that action and then come back to it after you've taken that action. That was when they explained to me, and I mentioned this today, but you all that were here today are going to have to hear it again. Uh, it was when they explained to me that the 12 steps are the prescription for alcoholism, that they work on alcoholism exactly like penicillin works on an infection. If I've got an infection that will kill me if it's not treated, but will respond to penicillin, I don't need to understand the origin, breadth, and nature of my infection. And I don't need to aggravate the medical profession and the people around me whining about that. The fact is, I could learn everything there is to know about the infection, and if I didn't do what I was supposed to do, I'd die dead as a doornail. It's kind of irrelevant what I know about the infection. I don't need to understand a single thing about how penicillin works in the human body. I don't need to believe that that little bottle of pills can take care of all these terrible things with magnificent me. And most importantly for me, I don't need to want to take the pills. That's irrelevant. If I've got the infection and take the pills as directed, I'll get this fine. They assured me that regardless of what was going on in this old crazy picture show in the back of my head, if I would do the actions that are the first nine steps of Alcoholics Anonymous in order to reach a state of recovery and then immediately begin doing the actions that are steps 10, 11, and 12 in order to get my daily reprieve and maintain my spiritual condition, that I'll be just fine. Thank you. And I want to tell you it's worked with me just exactly that way. And I've been so blessed to see it work exactly that way with hundreds of people in the last 37 years. And then they said that if I wanted to live, I was going to have to uh, get on my knees morning and night and ask and thank a power to cry to them myself. And tears came to my eyes. See, I'd thought for a couple of years, the little part of me that wanted to live knew that AA was the only shot I had. Uh, and, 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 and in order to get it, I thought I had to somehow start thinking, feeling, and believing the way it looks like to me, you thought, felt, and believed, and I tried, and I couldn't change anything. I'm talking about not a hair. I couldn't change anything about my thoughts, feelings, and beliefs. So when they told me I was going to have to get on my knees, the tears came to my cheeks, and I'm explaining to them <clears throat> why the second step is killing me and why I can't do that praying stuff. And uh, I finally heard them. I'm sure they told me, time and time again, but I hadn't heard it. I finally heard them when they said, oh, Don, you've got that backwards, too. We have never suggested that you think, feel, or believe anything. And my mouth probably fell open because I think that's the center of the universe. They said, well, no, we wouldn't do that. I said, in the first place, you are far too ill to have any valid thoughts, feelings, or beliefs. And they said, in the second place, the issue of whether you live or die is going to be determined solely by what you do. What you think, feel, and believe won't have a thing to do with it. So I said, if you want to live, you better get on your knees and start saying uh, please in the morning and thank you at night. And I don't, And they didn't said they didn't care what was going through my head. They didn't realize that what's going through my head is the most important thing in the universe. Uh, they, they, they said really ridiculous things like that my thoughts, feelings, and beliefs never leave a footprint on reality. Most important thing in the world, and it never leaves a footprint on reality. They tell me the only thing that leaves a footprint on reality is what I do. They tell me that if I'm doing the right thing, 
I don't need to worry so much about my motives because I'm going to be judged on what I do, not on whether I want to do it, not on whether it feels right when I'm doing it. I'm going to be judged on whether I'm doing the right thing or not. And they explained to me recovery works exactly, exactly that way. Well, I'd had no idea, of course, I, when they told me that, I thought that was ridiculous and that, uh, that I certainly would not do that praying crap. But I'd been given that gift I didn't know ahead. And sometime in the latter part of April of 81, I started getting on my knees morning and night and talking to the wall and uh, saying please and thank you. And the miracles of the second step started to happen, and the two beautiful miracles that happened to me on the second step. One is that once I became willing to act like a person would act if they really did believe that second step, if they really did with all their heart believe that there was some sort of power out here that could solve that humanly hopeless dilemma I'd admitted I was in when I did step one, when I became willing to act like a person would act if they believed that, I began to get all the benefits of believing it. And the second miracle was, when I began acting like that person, I began to become that person. It wound up being just like everything else in my life. I can't ever think my way into right acting. I always have to act my way and the right thinking. Uh, <clears throat> but at any rate, they led me through the third step in uh, Nashville. Cherry did, and I talked about that today, so I'm not going to go through details on that or the fourth or fifth step. They led me through that, through step six and seven. And, and I did think when I did my sixth and seventh step that uh, that was where, with God's help, I went to work on me to make me into what I decided a spiritual dawn ought to be. Uh, and uh, and I, uh, I'll touch back on that later, a little bit later. But uh, uh, <clears throat> then they led me through steps eight and nine. And as a pure byproduct of steps eight and nine, my law license got put back in order. Now, when I lost my law license, it wasn't, gee, whatever happened to Don Major. It was on the front page of the Louisville Courier Journal. It, was, it gave the bar an unbelievably black eye. I mean, it was awful. And I, if, if somebody had... When I was a year sober, if somebody had said, Don, list the 100 most likely things you will be able to do for a living the rest of your life, practicing law would not have been on that 100. I didn't think there was any way in the world I'd get a law, law license back. But I'll tell you, when we finally start trying to do the right thing, the forgiveness of non-alcoholics for us passes all understanding. It's not even fair, really. We get treated better than the poor schmuck that never fouled up. We really are the prodigal children. And <clears throat> I'll get, get to some more of that in a minute, but my law license got put back in order as a byproduct of 89. January 1983, 21 months sober. Since I could not find a job, was unemployed, could not get a minimum wage job in Nashville, I had no choice except to go back to Kentucky and Louisville and try to practice law. Terrified. I went back up. I didn't think Louisville AA would work like Nashville AA, and there were all sorts of people that I didn't need to be running back into, and I don't believe there was any paranoia in that. I believe the crap I had done in human terms, I didn't have any business in Louisville, Kentucky. I believe a loving God poured oil on the troubled waters of my past to keep the worst of what I feared from happening. But I got back, and I threw myself in that dumb old Louisville AA, and it wasn't a month before I thought it might be better in Nashville. And the second month I was in town, I'd never, I had some sort of vague awareness that there were things called AA conferences or conventions, but I, I'd never been to one. And the Kentucky State Convention was in Louisville that February, the month after I got in town, and a fellow who became a friend of mine who's dead now, Don Pritz from and Colorado was supposed to speak on Sunday morning. And Don got snowed in out west. Well, the Saturday morning speaker kept going and going and going. And I kept having and having and having to pee. 
when she got to about an hour, hour and 25 minutes, I, I, I gave up. And, and there were 2,000 people there. That uh, Conventions were bigger back then. There were fewer of them, and they were larger. And there were a little over 2,000 people there. So I finally gave up. I got to go to the bathroom. So I head out, and I'm heading in the <coughs> big convention center. I'm heading toward the men's room. And the host committee was huddling out there trying to figure out what to do about a speaker for Sunday morning. And one of them said, hey, I heard him over at the Hubbard's Lane meeting the other night. Let's put him up there. So they stuck me up there in front of 2,000 people at 22 months sober. And I thought it was the worst thing that ever happened. And like, uh, like events in my life always are, my judgment of events in my life is absolutely backwards. It's not just all. It's backwards. If I think there's no redemption in it whatsoever, it's the greatest tragedy that ever befell a fellow like myself. If I manage not to drink and keep on trying to take that stitch in the right place, it'll wind up being the foundation of some of the most beautiful things in my life. On the other hand, if when I first see it coming, I think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, it may be getting ready to try to kill me. probably is. Uh, and uh, that terrible thing of being stuck up in front of those people wound up being the basis, really, of the rest of my life. Uh, so many miracles began to happen. Uh, people began to ask me to speak here and speak there and to be their sponsor. And that same month, I saw Dana for the first time in over three years. And two months later, in April, Dana moved in with me and lived with me throughout her high school years. And she and I became dear friends and still are. And uh, as I mentioned this afternoon, we were on the phone a long time last night talking about her divorce. But uh, Dana and I can make the other one break out in the hives when get on their nerves so badly. But, but we sure do love one another, and we sure do have a great friendship. Uh, <clears throat> and all these miracles start happening. Uh, it, it just was unbelievable. Uh, I, <clears throat> I started making some money, and uh, I started wearing decent clothes again and, and driving nice cars, and, and all those great things are happening. But the first nine years that I was sober, relationships with the opposite sex and financial chaos just like to kill me. They like to beat me to death, and I tried so hard. And that's where six and seven came in. Something happened in May of 1990 that caused me to relook at 6 and 7, and I did. I had thought 6 and 7 were where, with God's help, I went to work on me to make me into what I had decided a spiritual Don Major ought to be when I did my fourth and fifth step. And up until I was nine years sober, that's the way I proceeded, not only thinking that was okay, absolutely convinced that that was the only responsible, proper way to do it. Uh, and I didn't do anything but wind up in the snake pit. I'd corner those character defects and say, God, come here, help me get rid of them, and God never showed up, and I didn't know why. And it turned out that I could have quoted the seventh-step prayer backwards, but I didn't realize what it really said and what it really meant. Uh, seventh-step prayer doesn't ask God to remove all my defects of character, and it certainly doesn't ask God to remove the ones I want gone. For nine years, I couldn't see that praying for a character defect to be gone because I wanted it gone is exactly the same spiritual mistake as praying for a bright red Corvette because I'm praying for my own selfish ends. The seventh step prayer asks God to remove the defects of character that stand in the way of the usefulness to my fellows. Just like the third step prayer you know, take away my difficulties. Not so I can be spiritual and sober and happy. Take away my difficulties. The victory over them will bear witness to those I would help of God's power, love, and way of life. The eighth and ninth step. Yeah, we're trying to put our lives in order, it says, but that's not our real purpose. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and those around us. It turned out the six and seven weren't where I went to work on myself with God's help. It was where I gave up on working on me. And I began stumbling in the direction uh, that I've stumbled since May of 1990. 
One of the first things that happened that very same month, I got back home and I knew this beautiful redhead that's sitting right in front of me here because her oldest daughter and my daughter had gone to a little private school together and graduated together, and Sharon had taught in that school for a while, but I'd met her then, but Sharon was married to somebody else, and uh, in May of 1990, I got back and said, I'm going to call Sharon, and I called her, and some things happened that caused her to return my call, which is her story. Uh, she says she was sitting at a stoplight and hadn't thought of me or my daughter for months and all of a sudden we came into her mind and then she walked in and there was a message on her answering machine and she was afraid not to call back. But, but at any rate, and I didn't use any tricks on Sharon. I, I didn't have any lists. Uh, at one point I had a list of 42 attributes for my perfect mate. What a freaking mess. Uh, <laughs> I didn't have any list. I didn't have any manipulations. The only trick I used on her was the trick. It's not a trick, but the blessing that works in every single human encounter. And that was laying aside whether I got what I wanted from Sharon, whether I got any love, comfort and understanding from her and praying over and over, Lord, please let me seek to love, comfort, and understand Sharon. And I want to tell you, folks, that will make you so attractive they will knock down the doors. Now, if you were doing it for that reason, it won't work. If you're doing it for that reason, it wouldn't work. But spirituality is the most attractive thing on the face of this earth. And that sweet lady and I, December the 26th, will have been married 28 years with no intervening separations or divorces. <laughs> I sponsor some guys who are, uh, who are psychologists and counselors, and they tell me, that it's not healthy to have a relationship in which you never, ever argue. And I tell them that they are welcome to their healthy relationships, that Sharon and I are doing just fine wallowing in our illness. Thank you. <laughs> but one of the big keys for Sharon and me is one of the big keys for me in my entire life, and that is courtesy. Nothing is more underestimated nor under, more underrated, I believe, as a spiritual attribute than courtesy. It's impossible to be discourteous and spiritual at the same moment. You just can't do it. You simply cannot be. And courtesy is the first step of seeking to love, comfort, and understand other people rather than to be loved, comfort, and understood by them. And one of the sad things is it seems to be easier for us to be courteous sometimes with strangers than it is those people that we live with that are the very closest to us. And that's just so sad. And Sharon and I have used courtesy with one another every single day, all day. And it's been a beautiful, beautiful thing. We don't count who gives on this and who gives on that. I tell you, if we did, I'd be so far behind that lady that there'd be no imagining, but, but we don't. We're both willing to try to give 110% to the other one. We're not worried about 50 and 50, and am I getting mine, or are you infringing on my boundaries here? We just try to love, comfort, and understand one another, and it sure does work well. That bar association that I had so embarrassed, and I only talk about this because a few guys I sponsored had a, actually had an intervention with me several years ago and said, Don, you've got to talk about it. I didn't want to talk about it because it felt like I was bragging on myself to me or something. But uh, that bar association that I, I so embarrassed. The first thing, I'd been back a few years and, and I, I got a phone call and said, Don, we want you to serve on this committee that interviews people that want to be judges and passes on whether they're qualified. And later on they said, Don, we want you to be chair of that committee. We'll put your name in the paper if these are the people we find qualified as chair of the committee. Um, they called me and said, Don, we want you to be sure and come to the Bar Association dinner this year. 
because we're giving you the Pro Bono Lawyer of the Year Award. We're, t we're giving you the award for the lawyer that does the most good for people without being paid for it. I want to tell you, the first 10 years I practiced law, nobody thought about Don Major and Pro Bono in the same term, in the same breath. Uh, then they called me and said, be sure and make the bartender. We're giving you the award for professionality and civility, which is the most coveted award at the bar. And uh, they called me and said, Don, why don't you come be a master at the end of court? We need you. We need a little drunken, uh, self-employed criminal defense lawyer to sit in here with the most important judges, the state Supreme Court judges, the dean of the law school, the most powerful lawyers and judges in Kentucky. Uh, we, we just need little old criminal defense lawyer like you. And I've sat on that for over 20 years as a master with 20 of people that I'm sure I don't belong there, but they don't act like they know I don't belong there. Uh, and, and my God has got such a sense of humor. Um, about nearly 15 years ago now, I was sitting in the barber chair and my cell phone rang. And it was the president of the state bar. And he said, Don, we've got a vacancy on the ethics committee. <laughs> the first 10 years I was sober, the only people I was more afraid of than the state bar ethics committee were the IRS and the FBI. Uh, <laughs> and I sat on that committee for 12, 13 years, and they put me on the, on, uh, and they made me the Kentucky uh, ethics hotline guy for criminal law so that if a lawyer in Kentucky got in an ethical dilemma and called me, if they did what I told them to do, they were absolutely insulated from any discipline by the bar, even if I turned out to be dead legally wrong. And that's an awful lot of trust to put in a guy that was in the asylum 18 times and destroyed everything in his life. The bottom line's real simple. I'd mentioned this this afternoon, but the things I'm describing, I've described with Sharon, my relationship with my children, and I have a great relationship with my 29-year-old son. I have a great relationship with my, my stepdaughters, but all those things. If God had said in May of 1990, when I was nine years sober, and I had a good life. I had a real good life. I had a miraculous life from where I came from. So, Don, make a list of the best you can possibly have in every area of your life, and I'm going to give you that. And I made that list of what I thought was the best I could have, and God had given it to me. I would have shortchanged myself in every single area of my life, in every single area, when I'm willing to let go all of my self-determined objectives, regardless of how I've dressed them up, regardless of whether I've dressed them, dressed them in security clothing, responsibility clothing, psychological clothing, spiritual clothing, when I'm willing to let go of all of those self-determined objectives and try to just take that stitch in the right place and leave the rest of it up to my God. God's got more beautiful things in man than anything I can imagine. I love you folks, and thank you so much for having listened to me so long this, uh, on this Saturday afternoon and evening, and thank you so much for having me. God bless.